I'm Mary. Uh, I'm going to talk about Pistol Slut, which is a game uh, I wrote in JavaScript. Um, you play the Pistol Slut in this game, uh, and I'll start off with a demo to show you how it works. So you're the little woman on the bottom there, um, and you have to kill all of, all of these policemen in a level. So yeah, you get the idea. OK. Um, so I wrote it in JavaScript, uh, and it's based on a framework called the Render Engine, which is written by a man called Brett Fattori. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, it runs in the canvas element, and it works in any modern web browser. But I'm not going to talk about any of that. Um, I'm going to talk about fakery, which I think is essential to making games. Um, collision detection, so the code that I used to uh, figure out whether two objects were colliding. Uh, artificial intelligence, so the code that runs the enemies. And at the end, a little bit about falling in love. Uh, so fakery, first up. Um, Recently, I read this book called Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which is by a man called John Le Carre. Um, and I became kind of completely obsessed with the book. I've read it several times. Um, and it's about MI6, the British Secret Service. And they discover that they've got a Russian agent working inside the organization. Um, and they don't know who he is, and they've got to find him. Um, and the name for such a person is a mole. Um, and the way this person works is they pretend to be in an, uh, uh, kind of helping the organization they're a part of, but actually they're working against it. Um, and I think if you're a mole, um, then you've got to keep like two realities in your head. Um, first of all, this kind of fake reality, which you're trying to convince all the people around you that you're working for British interests uh, to bring down the Russians or whatever. Um, but actually underneath there's this real reality where, in fact, you're trying to feed information back to the Russians or um, trying to sabotage British operations. And I think making games, you have to do exactly the same thing to keep these two realities in your head, where there's the kind of fake reality where you're trying to conjure these illusions in the player's head, so you want them to believe that they're really... Uh, a, a grenade has just gone off by their head, or um, that they're trying to kill policemen in some crazy utopian world or whatever. Um, but then underneath that, you've got the real reality, which is just pixels moving around on a screen. So you, a single red pixel might model something like a, a, a fireball coming out of an exploding barrel, or a piece of shrapnel from a grenade, um, or a flame licking up out of a bin that has a fire burning inside it. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a few of the bits of fakery that I did in Pistol Slut. Um, and first up, particles. So a particle is just a name for a single pixel which has a certain color and a set of behaviors. Um, and I use particles for a bunch of different things in the game. So the fireballs that are thrown out by an exploding barrel, um, the fragments of shrapnel that are produced by a grenade when it explodes, the shrapnel that's thrown out by a mortar round when it hits the ground, um, the flashes that come out of the muzzle of a gun when it's fired, the sparks that are thrown out by a firework exploding, the flames that come out of a barrel that's on fire, the debris that comes out when a bullet hits a wall and there's like this shower of sparks that come out, or the drops of blood that spew out of an enemy when they're hit with a bullet. Um, so this is a fire done with particles. Um, and there's four basic rules that control each of these particles. Uh, number one, they have a fixed life. 
So in the game, in pistol slide, it's 700 milliseconds. Uh, number two, they have a fixed color cycle. So they go from yellow to red via orange. Uh, number three, they start with a random speed. So that's how you get that high up red particle at the top because that had a higher speed than average. Um, and number four, uh, if your fire is burning between here and here, then each new particle is spawned at a random place along that line. And I use the same rules to produce these particles, uh, which uh, are for when a grenade goes off. So you can't quite see it on the slide there, but a grenade has gone off in the bottom right-hand corner um, of the screen, and then it's thrown out all these particles. Um, but then grenade particle, or rather grenade shrapnel particles, have a bit of extra behavior, which is when they hit a solid object, then you get these plumes of yellow near the bottom there. So uh, pieces of shrapnel have hit the floor and then thrown up more, more particles, which are all yellow and kind of simulate the idea of spark, a shower of sparks. Next bit of fakery in pistol slot is parallax scrolling. So this is a way of faking depth in a 2D game. So if you, and it's basically just blinds sliding, sliding over each other. So if you imagine that my two hands are my two, are two bits of uh, parallax layers, then there's three uh, things that control when you look at my hands, how far away they are in your brain. So number one is this hand, because it's slightly further away, looks a tiny bit smaller. Um, number two, if I move them at what I promise you is uh, equal pace past each other, then this one looks like it's moving very slightly slower. And number three, when these hands cross each other, this one, because it's nearer to you, obscures this hand. So <clears throat> I use those three things to generate this illusion of depth in the game. So you can see that in this, in this movie, I've taken out all the enemies. So that, la oh shit, you can't see it. Um, so the building is really close and it's moving faster. Those lanterns are further away and they're moving more slowly. And then these three street lamps, um, they'd all be the same size if they were all up close, but um, I've drawn them smaller and made them move more slowly, which makes them look like they're further away. Final bit of fakery I'm gonna talk about is performance. Um, I think Pistol Slut looks like something on the NES, so a game from 30 years ago, but you know it's running on a modern computer. And part of the reason, well, there's many reasons for this. Probably I'm a terrible programmer and I can't draw very well, but also um, there's not much performance available in the browser, um, though WebGL is looking pretty amazing. Um, and so I spent a lot of time optimizing code. Um, however, um, yeah, brilliant. Um, I find that when you try and make code run faster, it's often a specific thing to that piece of code that turns out to be the problem. So I dive into lots of different bits of code and, and say, okay, what's wrong with this? Why is it slow? And then fix the problem. But then there was a general technique that I used again and again and was able to apply to lots of different pieces of code that were trying to achieve very different things. And that was the concept of denial. So essentially, what can you ignore? Um, and then if you can ignore it, then it means you don't have to spend any processing power on it, and you can use that processing power on something else. So there's two ways to look at this. Um, if you imagine you're an object in the game, then do you have to do your thing, or can you just not bother? Um, so if I'm an enemy, do I need to move around? Or if I'm a fire, do I need to bother burning? Or if I'm a firework launcher, do I need to launch? Or if I'm an enemy, do I need to have a brain? Or can I just stand there? Or if I'm a piece of ordnance, like a bullet or a piece of shrapnel, do I need to continue to exist? And the other way to look at it is, if I'm an object in the game, then there's quite often I have to look at other objects in the game and make decisions about them. So this most, happen, most often happens with the enemies. So if I'm an enemy, then, and I'm trying to avoid killing my, my buddies who are on the same side as me, do I need to check out where they all are, or can I just look at a subset of the other enemies in the level? Or if I'm looking for a piece of cover, and I'm an enemy, do I have to consider all of the park benches in the level, or just a subset? 
or if I'm hearing all of these sounds of gunshots going off around me, do I have to respond to them all, or can I ignore some of them because they're so far away? And the way to decide on all of these questions is whether something's on or off camera. So if it's off camera, I probably don't have to care. But if it's on camera, I do have to care. So the question is, how do you decide whether something's on or off camera? And for that, we'll have to come back to it, because I need to talk about collision detection first. So collision detection is a code that figures out whether some, one object is hitting another object. And I did a kind of two-pronged approach to this. And first of all, the first approach is assuming that the world is a grid, which might look like this. So in this game, magic game with just black squares, then if two objects are in the same grid square, they're colliding. And if they're not in the same grid square, they're not colliding. So those two guys in the top left, different grid squares, not colliding. Whereas the guys in the bottom right, same grid square, so they're colliding. But the world's not a grid, so we need an extra approach. And this is called bounding boxes. So in this slide, the two key objects are the large black circles. And each of them has got a bounding box, which is just a rectangle which fits as closely as possible around the object. Um, and if the two bounding boxes of those two objects are intersecting, then the two objects are colliding. And if they're not intersecting, the two objects are not colliding. So now I'm going to talk about some of the specific approaches to collision detection um, <clears throat> that I use for particular objects, and starting off with bullets. So in this slide, the black rectangles, the small black rectangles, are a single bullet at different points in time. So the grenade, oh, sorry, the bullet <laughs> starts off at uh, position A, moves through position B, and ends up at position C. And when the bullet's at position A, then it's not colliding with anything. Whereas when it's at position C, then it's colliding with that large white rectangle. So we can just use bounding boxes here to figure out that it's colliding at position C. Um, and we would be done, because when a bullet hits something, it's just removed from the game. But there's a bit of extra stuff, because actually, it's, when a bullet hits something, it's not just removed from the game. There's also a shower of sparks that come out of the object it hit. So we need to find position B, because that's where the shower of sparks is going to come from. And so the thing about writing a game is that you don't actually see your objects move through every pixel on their path from A to C. So I see, uh, or rather the game engine, sees the bullet at position A, and then it next sees it at position C, and it's passed through position B, but it, we didn't see it. So you need to figure out where position B is. And the way you do this is you draw a line between position A and position C, and then you take the four lines that define the edges of the large white rectangle, and you say, OK, which of those lines is the line A to C intersecting with? Oh, it's the left-hand side, so you know which two lines are intersecting, and then you can find the intersection point, and you're done. Grenades. So grenades are a little bit different, because when they hit an object, they don't just disappear, they bounce. So for this, we'll need position B, but we already know how to do that. Um, but we also need to find out the new trajectory that the grenade's going to go on after it hits the large white rectangle. So it's the same thing again. It started off, off at position A, and it ends up at position C. We find position B to figure out where to bounce it from, and then we just need to find that gray line that's sort of pointing diagonally down in that direction. And the way you do this is that you know which side it hits, so it's that left-hand side. And so you just reflect the, bullet ve uh, sorry, the grenade vector in the side that it hits. So this is my side, this is the vector, I reflect it like that, and then I'm done. But there's an extra bit of complication with grenades. <coughs> Excuse me. Because grenades have an area where, so when you draw that line A to C, if you've got a bullet, you just draw it from the single pixel at position A to the single pixel at position C. But with a grenade, you need to figure out where to draw that line from. So let's say we pick the top left-hand corner of where the grenade is. So I draw a line from the top left-hand corner of position A to the top left-hand corner of position C, and that gives me line one. But we're a bit fucked because line one's not actually intersecting with a large white rectangle. 
OK, no big deal. We'll just draw that line from the bottom right-hand corner, right? So draw the line from the bottom right-hand corner of position A to the bottom right-hand corner of position C. Gives us line two. That line's intersecting. We're done. But what about this? So the grenade's approaching from a different angle in this scenario. And we draw that same line, bottom right-hand right corner of position A to bottom right-hand corner of position C. That gives us line one. Oh, no, it's totally not intersecting again. So need a bit of a rethink. And so you need to use a different strategy for grenades. And this is called sweeping, according to the internet. Um, so it's the same scenario. Grenade starts out at position A, ends up at position C, which is where we detect the collision. And then to find out where the grenade actually entered the, ob the object, and therefore find out where position B is, where we need to bounce the grenade from, then you just take the grenade when it's at position C and move it back along its trajectory to position D but we need to keep going because there's still no intersection with the side. So then we keep going. We move the grenade from position D back along to position E. Now we've got the intersection. Now we've got position B. We know where to bounce the grenade from. We're done. Ace. So with all of this in mind, then we can now figure out whether something's on or off camera. And the strategy is bounding boxes. So all of the objects in the game have a bounding box. And the view, the camera, is just a single large bounding box somewhere in the world. And so we can just say, OK, bin, is your bounding box um, intersecting with the view's bounding box? If it is, then you're on camera. If it's not, you're off camera. But we run into a performance problem here again, because this check of an, a bounding box against another bounding box to see whether they're intersecting is not slow, but it's not fast either. So we need to make it faster. For moving objects, there's not a lot you can do, apart from just try and write code efficiently. But with unmoving objects, then it's quite easy because their bounding boxes don't change. So this means when you load the level, then all of the unmoving objects like bins or park benches or the floor or the fences at the both ends of the level, um, their bounding boxes are not going to change throughout the entire game. So when the level loads, you just say to each object, right, totally generate your bounding box, um, and then uh, store it. So this means when you do that check of the view bounding box against an object's bounding box, it doesn't have to generate its bounding box. It can just go and fetch it from memory. So that's a performance improvement. But you can actually take it a bit further, because um, the answer to whether a particular unmoving object is on or off camera doesn't change all the time. So if the camera hasn't moved, the answer's still the same. So I, let's imagine some scenario where I say, uh, Bin, are you on camera? And he fetches his bounding box, which he's got pre-stored, and then he compares it against the uh, bounding box of the camera, and then comes back with the answer and says, uh, yes, I'm on camera. Um, and then I come back two seconds later, and the camera hasn't moved in that time. Um, and so I say, uh, Bin, I need to ask you again, are you on camera? And he says, like, dude, you totally just asked me that. Um, I've already stored the result to your last request, so I'm just going to give you the answer from that cache. And then you, don't need to, you only need to clear the cache when the camera moves, which only happens when the pistol slot moves, which is, relatively speaking, not that often. So this means that you can check whether objects are on or off camera um, extremely cheaply, performance-wise. And that was a big, big win. So, penultimate topic, um, artificial intelligence. So this is the code that runs the enemies. And the technique I used is called behavior trees. Um, and a behavior tree is just a special type of state machine, uh, except it's in a tree structure, obviously. Um, and so because it's a state machine, then that means the objects that it controls have states. So one of the states that a enemy in pistol slot can be in is fighting. And another state it can be in is shooting. But these states are slightly different from each other because fighting is like it's you're not actually the enemies when they are in the fight state, they're not actually doing anything. It's more like a gateway to a set of states where they'll actually achieve some useful function. Whereas fighting, oh sorry, shooting is actually doing something. So when a, 
enemy is in the shoot state, it's actually firing actual bullets with an actual gun. So in this diagram of a totally generic behavior tree, then um, fighting would be the fork point, so uh, in the middle there. And shooting would be an example of a leaf node. So the general rule is, if you're at a fork point, you're deciding what to do next. Whereas if you're at a leaf node, then you're actually deciding to achieve something and do some sort of action in the game, like shooting a bullet. Now, there's two, way, there's two rules that govern movement around the behavior tree. And the first one is, can I do this? So before moving to a state, then the code always asks, am I allowed to do this? So it might say, am I allowed to fight? And the code comes back and says, yeah, there's totally an enemy there, and he's got guns, so you should totally fight him. Um, or with shooting, can I shoot? Um, yeah, you've totally got bullets, you've got a gun, do it. And then the other thing that governs movement around the behavior tree is a strategy. And this is a method for choosing where you're going to move next in the tree. So in this, we're in the fight state, and we need a strategy for choosing whether to try and shoot or try and throw a grenade. And the two strategies that I used in Pistol Slut, there are a bunch of others that you can use in behavior trees, but this was enough for Pistol Slut. Um, the first strategy I used was prioritization. And in this, then, you just start at the left, and you run the first sub-branch that you can run. So I'm in the fight state, and I say, OK, start at the left, can I shoot? The answer comes back, no. Um, so I say, all right, then, can I throw a grenade? The answer comes back, yes. So I move to the throw grenade state. I throw a grenade, and then I move back up to the parent state. So that's prioritization. So you choose the first one that can run, and then you go back to the parent. The other strategy is sequentialization, which is where you run every sub-branch that you can. So you might end up running all of the sub-branches, or none, or some. So I'm in the fight state. The strategy is sequentialization. Um, I say, can I shoot? And the answer comes back, yes. So I move to the shoot state. Uh, I shoot, and then I move straight on to the throw grenade state, and can I and say, can I throw a grenade? The answer comes back, yeah, you can totally throw a grenade. So I throw a grenade and then move back to the fight state. So with all that in mind, here is the only slide with any code on it. Um, it's JSON, so it's not even real code. Um, but it's pretty much all of the code that, all of the behavior tree for Pistol Slut. Um, and we're going to go through it. So I'm on line one. I'm in the idle state. The strategy of the idle state is prioritized. So this means I need to find the first child that can run and then run it. But actually, the idle state only has one child, and that's line three, fight. Um, so I say, can I fight? And the code comes back and says, yeah, there's totally an enemy there. You can fight. So I move to, to, to the fight state. The strategy, again, is prioritized. So now I've got three children to choose from. So I check out the first one on line five, find cover. So I say, can I find cover? And the code comes back and says, yeah, there's, there's a bin between you and the enemy. You can run and hide behind that. So I move to the find cover state. And the strategy of the find cover state on line five is sequentialization. So this means I'm going to run all the children that apply and then move back up. So I go to line seven and say, can I turn towards the player? And the code comes back and says, yep, you're turned away from him, so uh, you should totally turn towards him. So I move to the turn towards player state, turn towards the player, and then I move right onto line eight and say, can I stand? And the code says, yeah, you can stand because you're crouched at the moment. So I move to the stand state and then I stand up. And then I move to line nine and I say, can I run for cover, which just comes back, yes. And so I run for cover and then I move, move to line 10 and I say, can I shoot? And again, you've got bullets, you've got guns, you can totally shoot. So I move to the shoot state and then I shoot. And then I go back up to the fine cover state. Now, I'm probably not in cover still. So the answer on line five, can I find cover, will come back, yes, you can. So I'm going to keep on looping through this find cover state um, until I get to cover. And let's say I actually make it there and I don't get killed on the way. Then eventually, I'll come back up to line five and say, can I find cover? And the answer comes back, no, you can't, because you're already in cover. You're already ducked down behind that bin. 
So now I say, okay, back up to the fight state, line three, and then I say, I'm, in this, I'm using the prioritized strategy. So I check out find cover again, still can't find cover because I'm still ducked down behind that bin. And so I go to line 13, the throw grenade state, and I say, can I throw a grenade? And it said, the code comes back and says, yeah, you've got grenades, throw one. So I throw one, and then back up to the fight state again, line three. Now it's gonna be find cover, can't do that because it's still in cover. Throw a grenade, can't do that anymore because you've just thrown one. And so then you move to line 14, can I shoot? And you shoot. So that's basically how the AI in pistol slot works. There's a bit of extra stuff, but it's not that instructive. Um, now, why is this cool? Um, I think, number one, with that behavior tree, then you can move around that JSON really, really easily. So you can change the behavior of the AI um, with minimal code uh, changes. Um, so obviously there's a bunch of code which does inferences about where the bins are and, and whether you've got any bullets and all of that stuff, but that's all nicely tucked away inside, you know, and modularized, and it's, 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 it's kind of um, not dependent on other bits of code. Um, and second of all, I think that it, you can actually read that JSON and understand it. So I showed this JSON to my mum when I was trying to talk about uh, Pistol Slot and what I've been working on in my spare time. And I think she totally got it, I think. Um, and so I think this means you can collaborate on AI with non-programmers, and I think it's always good to be able to do that. So penultimate topic before I talk about falling in love. Um, I want to talk about discovery. Um, when I wrote, Pistol Slot was the first game I've written, um, and it was the first major JavaScript project I'd done and I'd never done any, or hadn't done much AI work, and hadn't done anything to do with collision detection as far as I can remember. And I didn't really read up that much in advance, and probably if it had been something I was doing for work, I would have felt obliged to do that, and so I would have done. But because it was for fun, then I kind of just want, didn't want to spoil a surprise, and so I figured out that grenade sweeping stuff, and. Um, figured out you know, why my uh, enemies were running around madly shooting each other and um, didn't Google much and didn't read any books um, in advance just because that process of discovering how to do something, even when you know someone else has already solved this problem, I think is like one of the most joyous feelings in the whole world. Um, and so that's why I didn't want to spoil the surprise. So I suppose what I'm saying is don't read any books and don't learn anything. Um, <laughs> except by doing. Um, and so the final topic is falling in love. Um, and uh, this is not really about code that much, so apologies. Um, one evening, maybe a few months ago, um, I was in my kitchen writing some code for Pistol Slap. Um, and I had this ticket to go and see this band called Wolf Parade, who are really, really good. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and they were playing down the road from me, where I live in Berlin. Um, and I was really into the code, and I really wanted to stay and, and write it, but then I sort of forced my, tore myself away, and then dashed down the road, went to this gig, and then after that, I ended up going out with some friends and, 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 and drinking quite a lot and stuff. And then I came home at sort of seven or eight in the morning, um, as it's kind of still drunk, basically, um, and sat down and carried on, picked up where I'd left off with the code. Um, and uh, I'm in a band um, uh, as a sort of separate thing. Um, and so when I write songs, then more and more often recently that I've started to write about my real life rather than about more generic things. Um, and so I wrote a song about the fact that I'd been writing the code for Pistol Slot in my kitchen and then run out to see Wolf Parade and then got drunk on gimlets with my friends and, 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 and gone to some clubs and stuff. And um, then when, when I figured out grenade sweeping, then I was in a bar called Forveen, a really nice bar in Berlin, um, drinking Hemingway's. So whenever I think about the grenade sweeping code, I think about the taste of Hemingway's, which is a, it's a really nice cocktail, by the way. It's got grapefruit juice and some sort of red thing and, and gin. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, 
I sort of felt like Pistol Salt was becoming entwined with my life. And then um, some of the bits of graffiti in the level, I, I, it, it is level singular at the moment, um, in the level in Pistol Slut are from my diary uh, or things that I'd seen around Berlin. Um, and then recently I found myself at a party talking about Pistol Slut to a stranger who was a non-programmer. And he seemed to sort of find it interesting, I hope. Um, and so I suppose what I'm trying to say is that Pistol Slut have become more and more entwined with my life, or more like what, more importantly, programming has become entwined with my life. And I think falling in love, like with a person, is so th thrilling because um, they show you these possibilities that you'd never even realised existed. So they show you new ways of thinking about things or, 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 or new perspectives. And so it sets off all of these endorphins in your brain that are just super exciting. Um, and so I felt like the same thing happened with Pistol Slap, in the sense that it had become entwined with my life and, and different parts of my life had started to inform each other because of it. So, you know, the songs I was writing and the code I was writing and the friendships I was having and the bars I was going to and, and, and the graffiti I was seeing all kind of became entwined. And so I suppose, in summary, what I mean is that Pistol Slap made me fall in love with programming. Thanks. Uh, any questions? My name or Pistol Slut's name? <laughs> What's the story of the name? Oh, okay. Um, basically, it was a joke. Um, uh, I started writing the code uh, last summer, um, and I was thinking about the most ridiculous name that I could have, and I thought, well, surely I've got to combine sex and violence into a single phrase. Um, <laughs> And then I thought, okay, yeah, Pistol Slap, brilliant. And so then I, when I was talking about the fact that I was writing this game to my friends, they said, what's it going to be called? And I said, as a joke, Pistol Slap. And then I tried to change it later, but they were all like, no, 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 no. That's the best thing about it. Um, <laughs> so it stuck. Um, so you can play it at pistolslap.com if you want to. Any, anyone else? How did you choose the name Sylvester for your JavaScript file? Sorry, say that again? I was going through your code. How, was, uh, how did you choose the name Sylvester for your main JavaScript file? Uh, actually, that's not mine. That's uh, made by a, a man called James Coughlin, who's an excellent JavaScript developer. Um, it's a library for doing uh, mathematical uh, calculations based on vectors. Um, I don't know how he chose it, so you'd have to ask him. But he blogs at jcoughlin.com. Um, he's a super genius. You should totally check out his code. Did you look at Box2D for your, uh, for your physics framework? And what yeah. You think of it? So um, I found out about Box2D at the Berlin JavaScript group quite recently. And I was like, God damn it. All of those nights crying into my gimlet of, about you know, the fact that my fucking grenades were still bouncing into bins and not on them. Um, uh, so I, I, I nearly killed myself at that point. <coughs> but then I thought, it's fine. I'll just totally integrate it. So I spent a very difficult week integrating Box2D with the game, but found out that actually there were some things that, um, because I'd written them specifically for my game, were better in my collision detection code. But this is not to say that Box2D sucks, because it's awesome, obviously, but it solves a much greater, more general class of problems. And so I found that I wanted specific behavior for different objects, and so I found I kept my code in the end. But Box2D is totally great. So if, if anyone's writing a game, use that, not my collision detection code, because it sucks. Anyone else? Nope? OK, thanks. Did you remember the baby? Oh, no.